the Tinterland, East Gippsland, um, the little settlement I'm in is Goongarra. It's between the Erinundra National Park and the Snowy National Park. So it's pretty beautiful along the Broadrib River. Yes. Um, wilderness in the upper catchment on that side. That side, it's logging zone. Um, we're also surrounded by logging as well. What's not National Park is being heavily logged and clear felled. So. Yes, well, we've always thought this, but a study that's just come out um, from the ANU and Melbourne Uni shows that where the logging um, regrowth grows back after the total clear fell, which is the only method used around here, even though they might give it a different name of seed tree, um, it's pretty well clear fell back to bare earth burn. And then what comes up is like, um, it, it's, tr it's converted to a pulpwood farm, basically. You don't get your forest back. What you get back is a tree crop. And it's perfectly suited for the wood chip industry because they like the nice, young, white, straight, uniform, predictable trees. So where we used to have age diversity, species diversity, ferns, you know, the different stratas in the forest, you just get the one species coming back, thick as hairs on a cat's back. Yes, I see what you mean. by causing thinning and thus drying and warming. Okay, as well as really thick regrowth that's very thick and very flammable, they compete with each other for light and nutrient and water, so you also get a lot of them die off, which are then, like, it's just like creating a tinderbox. One of the dead wood to carry the fire and to burn really well, and then all this young, oil-filled, eucalypt foliage and it's just like a funeral pyre especially when it's around um, towns and communities it, it really goes up like a bomb whereas you get your natural forest and you get your different strata in the forest you get your canopy from the old growth really high um, very hard for that to carry a fire like a, a crown fire as in the younger forests that carry crown fires you get the um, mid-story, you get the tree fern understory that creates this microclimate where there's always dampness, there's moss on logs, there's, and it's just very fireproof. Natural forest is fireproof, and a lot of lightning strikes actually hit in those areas and they never go anywhere. But you get a lightning strike on a ridge top or a regrowth forest and it just goes like a bomb. So that's because it lacks the tall, the high canopy, the undergrowth that keeps it wet. The shade, what? the coolness. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole new, it's a whole other climate. Um, and, and people, you can go into a, an old growth natural forest on a really hot day and you just notice the temperature drop. Yeah, enormously. Mm. Yes. But you dry a forest out by logging it, opening it up to the sun, to the wind. Um, everything just dries out and as the young regrowth dries it also sucks up more water so you don't get as much water in the stream so it's it's drying out that whole canopy the, the whole um landscape the hillsides wherever they log it's drying it out and creating a, a different forest that's far more flammable the way i see what's happening with the government plan burns. Mm. It gives the, the community a false sense of security. They have to do something to, to look after people from you know, big bad fires. It's actually climate change that's creating it and the logging. Both of those together are a deadly combination. Well, in fact, the logging, according to some theories, is creating the climate change, certainly in the exactly. hinterlands. It's, 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 a, you know, it's a feedback loop that's just not going to end unless the government does something to say, right, this is enough, let's try and get it back to as it was. But what they're doing as a solution is saying we need to burn to stop it burning. And what yeah. they're doing, what they're doing is taking out the natural fireproofing of a forest. And that is all the little hoppers and scratches and diggers like the potteries, the bandicoots. That, that turn over leaf litter. Lyrebirds, they can, they can um, cover, turn over about two and a half tonnes a year, each lyrebird. So they're constantly making this compost out of the leaf litter and twigs on the forest floor. The mosses, the fungi, mm. the termites, all the insects, the moth larvae that, that are actually evolved to eat dry gum leaves, not much else is. 
these are the things that when they put a fire through and just say, all oh, right, we're safe now, it's all burned, mm. they are destroying the very thing that can fireproof a forest that's mm. been working for millions of years. This is the leaf litter that all the animals dig up in the forest? Yeah, constantly turning over so that it dig, you know, turns into soil and compost. And, and it holds a huge amount of water. Oh, water, nutrients, yeah, yeah, it grows the fungi. You so know. it's not exactly flammable. It's not flammable, but it's what the public are, are taught to fear. Yes. You know, but <laughs> no, you leave the little animals in here and they'll get rid of it. They'll turn it over and digest it and the fungi will eat through it. So they're killing off the little animals. They're, they're exposing them to predation by foxes. They're taking that layer out that shades the forest floor that keeps the dampness going. And if anybody's ever made a compost, they know you've got to keep moisture in it and you've got to have your little greeblies and bacteria and everything working together to break down that leaf litter and the twigs. And that's why the old growth forest won't burn. And up here during the 2014 fires, we saw it roar through a lot of fairly dry open forest that's been logged. As soon as it hit Brown Mountain, it went out. They tried to burn it with, you know, Deppy were trying to burn. They tried to burn Brown Mountain purposefully, uh, Deppy being the department of... <laughs> Deppy being the Department of Primary Industry, uh, right. Environment and Primary Industries. Um, and they, what they were doing is not just, you know, they weren't fighting the fire, they were just lighting more fire. That's a whole other story, the way they managed these fires. In Their intention was to light a fire that they could manage, which would mean that by the time the wildfire got to it, it would uh, run out of fuel. The, that's their well, theory. That's, yeah, it also created an awful lot of really good overtime and bonuses. Mm. Uh huh. Um, but <laughs> anyway, uh, well, that's a valid. Did, that's a valid thing to comment on. Oh God, it is. Because it's and not. We dare like, not because oh my God, you're you're questioning these brave firefighters. Well, I didn't see any firefighters actually front a fire with some water. They were just lighting fires all the time. So the boundary was getting bigger and bigger, and that, you know, the, the bushfire probably would have been this big, but the way Deppie were managing it, the government firefighters, they were just kept lighting fires to try and burn back into it, and then they'd escape and jump, they'd have to bulldoze and light another fire, and I'm sure about half the size of this fire was due to government-initiated um, bushfires in the hottest period, in the dry summer. And, um, well, certainly the statistics show that most uh, bushfires are initiated by human activity. Yeah, yeah right, but this one was initiated a lot by, by lightning yeah. strikes. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. we had the big one up at Dedic. They didn't jump on that. Mm. That was one they could have jumped on immediately. That's the one that got out of control and they were sort of waiting for it to come out, which meantime it got bigger and bigger until February the 9th when it was so big they couldn't do anything about it and it just, it just sort of took out half of Tubbet, um, Boning, Goongra, we were surrounded by fires and that February the 9th it just, you know, burned out the top end of Goongra and took out so much forest. It just, it was so intense. There was a a green thing, a living thing left after it went through, and this is just for miles and miles. To that extent. Somebody said they could have got in there, the rappel crease could have gone in, mm -hmm. there was actually a way to get in there with four-wheel drives. They could have done something about that, but they, they didn't. Now, they what don't was use this? the strike team anymore, do they, no, as they used to? it's all too dangerous. But yeah. So they just wait for it to come out and make the fires bigger mm. and bigger and bigger. And we, our volunteer fire brigade here, had to go out at night and put out fires that Deppy had lit the night before and went back home. You know, they've got bank hours for like 9 no, to 5. they knock off at 5 o'clock. They're not... They're not patrolling at night. They're not doing work on fires at night when they could, when it's when it's cooler, when it's damper. The air's got more Is this in the middle of a bushfire they go home at night? They go home at night and they leave it up to us volunteers, our mm. CFA, to go out and patrol at night at two in the morning, putting their fires out that got away. Um, and then they come back in the morning at nine o'clock and light them all up again for the heat of the day. Has anyone died as a result of this, do you think? 
Um, we were lucky in this fire, in, in this summer fire, no. There was nobody that died as a result of that. I'm not sure what's happened in other fires in previous years. So the major fires that you're describing uh, in this series of events were in the logged areas? No, some of it was National Park. There was a lot that was National Park. Once that Dedic fire got out old growth and it got ahead of steam. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the old growth ash forest on that really hot blow up day, I don't think much would have saved it. But on a you know, normal hot summer day, but when you get really hot winds coming in from um, the northwest, it will take out rainforests. And that's what happened at Martins Creek um, down the road here, the bottom two thirds of the Martins Creek Rainforest Reserve. Such a loss, got taken out by that really big, hot, intense fire on the night. And that was, that was climate. I mean, that's number one thing that actually drives a fire and how intense it is. Number two, I'd say, is, is what it's burning. And that can often be the logging regrowth that makes it more intense and more dangerous. Okay. Uh, so you're saying that old growth forests ultimately went up. Uh, what about the argument, though, that old growth forest doesn't usually burn easily and as we remove it, we're increasing climate change? So it seems to me that it would be better to have more old growth forest, less logging, to reduce the speed of climate change even uh, and the risk of any forest fires. That's logical and that's what all the science is saying but the government would prefer to keep the logging industry making that money. Um, a few jobs, I think there's 40 jobs involved in East Kippsland, but we're still destroying what has the ability to moderate our climate, and that is forest. The, the carbon capture and storage units, you know, the, the best in the world that we've got is our forests. We're knocking them down and creating these, you know, smoke, just ash landscapes with nothing there. Um, so the more that they log, the more that the climate is actually heating up, the less carbon there is stored in the forest, the less um, temperature moderation there is over the landscape, and of course our bushfires are going to get much worse. Indeed, it's really frightening to contemplate how hot it can get. Uh, the 2009 fires were utterly scary even for people in the city because of the heat going over 46 degrees in places. Um, I mean, the the uh, the temperature of the day. And the to me, it was obvious that if we keep removing um, uh, trees and forest, we're removing that microclimate uh, that just keeps um, heat islands from forming. Uh, I mean, as long as you have trees uh, covering the surface of Victoria, um, it just can't get that hot. You're not going to get 46 degrees in a rain for or in a an old growth forest unless you've actually got a fire there mm. It wouldn't reach that even on a 46 degree um, a day outside the forest No, and I think in the past there has you know lightning strikes. Yes, you know southeast Australia does get a lot of lightning strikes and historically that's always been the case pre-european pre-aboriginal um, yeah, the there forests, were very big forests. They were very big forests and they had that structure where you know there are all these um, fire breaks in the landscape, all the wet gullies, mm. the south facing slopes, um, the forest that had a lot of, um, you know, thick undergrowth, where it wasn't thick undergrowth that stopped that, that heat and the wind driving fires through. Um, in some areas, it was so, um, just naturally, it would open out and become dry. Uh, sort of grassy understory forest and that's what a lot of the early settlers described mm. but it wasn't due to burning it was due to lack of burning mm. and that's what a lot of the science is now picking up on yes and we're just saying oh no the Aborigines used to burn so we've got to do the <coughs> to be safe you know? no there's very little real evidence of that now that's that there right. was any large-scale burning Coming up this way, we've observed in the areas that have been really badly burned, uh, piles of uh, fallen logs and tree litter piled up, um, obviously by bulldozers and things. Now, was that a fuel creation exercise by, um, by DPI uh, in order to do burning off? I've seen that done in the Mornington Peninsula too. You get to an area that's 
been so thin that there's hardly any undergrowth. In fact, there's an absence of fuel. And so they're putting fuel there to start fires, even though the major rationale for having burning offs lately has been there's too much fuel, we have to keep it down. But they're having to pile it up. Now, I've just gone through kilometres and kilometres of massive bushfire and it's full of um, fuel piles that have obviously been man-made that have been burned too. What they are, and I have actually questioned this and I've formally tried to get an answer, what they're doing now, they have this dangerous trees policy because all of these trees that are left standing along tracks are dangerous. They might just fall on cars at any moment. So they have to go down and right along the tracks and cut down every tree that might possibly fall. And I've got photos of ones that are solid as a rock, not any rot in them, not leaning, and they've cut them down. And when they cut them down, of course, where you would have had a tree with a green leafy head and a trunk, you now have this pile of, you know, it, it's mm. a, it's just a... A, a dried pile. It's, yeah. it's a tinderbox waiting, you know, to burn and along the side of the roads. Like, hang on, weren't you trying to make the roads safer? And all they've done is sort of bull bulldoze all of these trees and tree heads up along the side of the road. So now, if there's another fire that comes through, they're just going to be these massive big bonfires. How long has that been going on for this business of cutting them down because they're dangerous? We just had that down here the um, year before. Yeah, 2013 they started doing that down along Martins Creek. So, that area. so yeah. all of these habitat trees, the ones that are really important for habitat, Feed trees for gliders, you know, the nectar producing trees, they're the best, the oldest ones are the best. Cut them all down because they're dangerous. Is there any idea, does anyone have any idea of what the governments, the success of governments think they're doing with this area? Are they going to turn it into some plantation forest or are they going to turn it into farmland well, or are they going to build to turn it apartments? Into, into plantations, that's what's been happening for the last 40 years, it's conversion right. to plantations. But now the wood chip industry is starting to say, no, nah, we don't want those wood chips from South East Australia too far away, we'll get our wood chips from, you know, Vietnam or somewhere else that's got the eucalypt plantations growing. So now Deppy, who's, who's had this agenda to create this wonderful wood chip farm for the Asian wood chip market for 40 years, it's starting to fall in a heap. So, God, we've got to keep ourselves relevant somehow. Oh, yeah, they'll I know, lose the fire economy. Yes, and they call it red gold now. And the people at Glen Allerdale... Fire there, economy? Bent, a fire economy, you know, keep keep Deppy relevant. So how are they doing this? What does fire economy mean? Well, it keeps the people employed, burning, cutting down trees, oh, to prevent bu tracks, bush fires and trees bush falling on people. If there is a bush. bush fire, you beauty, we get a lot of, um, you know, extra income for this and we can employ our mates on bulldozers at $3,000 a day to push tracks and push trees over and all, oh, I don't know. You know, it might not be any good, but we've got to keep them employed. And you, you'd think they could employ a few of them as forest rangers, wouldn't you? Oh, putting in picnic tables and walking tracks maybe might be a better oh, thing. But, monitoring. You know, a lot of these boys do love their matches. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you look at the uh, profile of a pyromaniac. Oh, my God, I reckon a lot of them would be perfect for those boys in, in green, green overalls and driving around in those uh, vehicles. You've often spoken um, about how Vic Forests uh, um, has uh, outstanding debentures, I think, and how uh, it's had a lot of money from the government, from taxpayers. And it, um, my impression has been that uh, the forestry in industry somehow has uh, some kind of supply of money from the taxpayer to uh, maintain a very cheap supply of wood to someone or something. It's always been hard for me to believe that was just wood chips. Um, what's happening to the hardwoods and so on? Well, about 85% of what comes out of a forest is chipped. Um, when you look at the whole forest biomass, there's about 2% that ends up as soy timber. And the rest is either wasted or wood chipped. Okay. So it's the wood chip industry that's driving this whole thing. They say, oh no, it's a saw log driven industry, but there's such a tiny percent now of the market that requires hardwood timber. Most of it is pine for all of our building needs, you know, whether it's composite wood products or laminated veneer lumber, or whatever. Builders prefer pine. So why are we still logging the forests when there's hardly anybody buying this stuff? It's because of the waste that's created, and this is what's happened ever since the wood chip industry came on shore. And the, 
late 60s, early 70s. Clear felling started to create waste. Um, so that's what's happening with our logging industry. Um, to keep this thing going, and you have to wonder, well, it doesn't make economic sense, environmental sense, electorally it's a real loser. People hate this, this whole industry. Why does the government keep doing it? Yes. So you wonder, is there money exchanging hands somewhere, like we've been seeing, you know, that's coming out of all this IBAC inquiry stuff? There's got to be corruption behind it. It doesn't make sense any other way you look at it. And we've been trying to work this out for the 30 years. Our group so it's still, you still don't know what's driving no. it? Well, it would have to be political donations. Jobs for the boys. That's but where do they get all the money to make the political donations? Well, from knock, knocking down our forests. It's not the poor old workers that are in the, in the sawmill sort of mm. shoving bits of timber back and forth. It's not the log truck drivers that are working long hours carting, you know, tons of our forest to the, to the export chip mill in little pieces like matchboxes. Yep. It's, it's the people who stand to make lots of money, the big wood chip mill, the mills yep. that are involved with them, that supply them with wood chips. They are making money hand over fist. This is free public asset. We are paying the industry millions of dollars a year to go, to go and cut down our forests, public forests, using public money, and we have to, we get nothing from it. What, the people who are benefiting is probably, you know, there's more jobs in the paper mills over in the Asian countries, Japan, um, and that keeps those factories making a lot of profit, but there's nothing happening here except for those few people. Now, they're making, they're making millions of dollars from virtually mining our public lands. So that money, to be, to be able to continue that, that would have to be, you know, you know. It's a pretty ancient sinecure, isn't it? It goes back as almost as far, well, it goes back to the beginnings of Australia. <laughs> yes, that's democracy, unfortunately. It's the, it's the uh, Australian that can style. pay governments to allow them to do things, whether it's the mining industry, tobacco industry, packaging industry. Are there any industry. laws guaranteeing a supply of wood to anyone? Um, that you know? Yes, Australian Paper down in La Trobe Valley, they had a, um, a, a long contract drawn up for very cheap access to forests for X number of years, decades I think, um, and the government say they can't get out of that, but I'm pretty sure they can if they read the fine print. Um, as far as... Um, the licences here, uh, well obviously Eden has now said, sorry, um, the buyers of the East Gippsland wood chips have said we don't want any more after December 2014, thanks. And so the industry here is just in absolute cold panic. They don't know what to do. Except burn fires and save people from them. Uh, well, that's another way to keep the, yeah. the department going and the, the boys on the bulldozers. They seem so resistant to the tourism industry or... or or the pharmaceutical it's industry, a, or so many things. A, it's like a mafia brotherhood. It's just, it seems to be a generational mindset. thing, and it's localised, yeah. isn't it, to particular forests? It goes back generations. Oh, look, it's not just localised. Yeah, it does go back generations. But localised to particular forests and owners and yeah. mills and but it's, arms. But it's worldwide. You just, uh, yes. It's, it is like a global mafia, the way that the, the logging industry just mm. seemed to dictate to governments all around the world, and it's happening everywhere. And East Gippsland, I actually did a um, comparison between what's happening in the Amazon and what's happening in East mm. Gippsland. And relative to the area that we've got and the area and how much is being taken out each year as Clearfell logs, as um, yeah, Clearfell areas, it's pretty much on a par with the Amazon. It's just like, you know, East Gippsland is no better. And here we are saying, oh, the world's best practices, it all grows back, it's all renewable. It's not. It's bullshit. They are destroying mm. what is irreplaceable. Irreplaceable. We have 600-year-old trees. We radiocarbon dated the wood from near the centre of the tree. 600-year-old trees. And it's just turned into this smoky, ashen landscape, and it goes off to, it goes off to you know, Asian wood chip factories. If it was anywhere else in the world, they would be, they would be valuing these forests as something so rare. It would be the antiques of the natural world. And they'd be paying, you know, people would have to be paying big money to come and experience and stand amongst these giants and just be awestruck. But no, paper cups, throw away paper.